Ashok Kumar, Managing Director, LKW Investment Advisors. He joins us in our Mumbai studios. And when I said it's a somber day on Dalal Street and an opportune moment to introduce you, Ashok, I was referring to the fact that you had uh, a month ago indicated, uh, in a sense, hold your horses, this might be a, a tough innings because this was immediately after the bullishness following the rate cut. Yes, clearly. Uh, Manvi, uh you know, not to be, it's, it's not as though I'm happy that the markets are down, but we're very clearly, I mean, there were global concerns. There was this political, uh, you know, overhang that was there. And, uh, you know, the, these scenarios are playing out. So things are not uh, looking as hunky-dory as they were a month ago, clearly. And uh, as far as you go into the future, I, I think it's looking as uncertain as ever. You're looking at a, a winter session of parliament that promises to be, you know, as, uh, as stormy as the monsoon session. Uh, you have global factors that are still at play. There's the risk of a U.S. Fed rate hike. So all, all these factors uh, will continue to overhang on the market, but uh, these are good buying opportunities. There would be good buying opportunities in the months ahead. Someone with a long-term view can start accumulating and do it uh, selectively, gradually. And that there could be money for the taking about 15 to 18 months down the line. You could laugh your way to the bank. Okay, you know, when we're talking about investing opportunities, uh, let's just uh, rewind uh, to some events that have taken place since our last meeting, um, Ashok. And I'm going to start with the various uh, uh, schemes that the government has launched, which broadly come under the gold schemes umbrella. The first one, of course, are the bonds. And I wanted you to really um, assess uh, how these bonds are likely to be received in the market. What's the upside? What's the downside? Do they make sense at all? Let's start with the bonds. Yeah, clearly, if, if you look at it theoretically, it makes great sense uh, that there's a lot of gold that's locked away in India. I, you know, uh, at various investment seminars that I speak at, I find that there's a uniform view that we Indians are the best investors in gold. I often make it a point to correct that statement and say that we are great holders of gold. So it's been, uh, you know, coming down the generations. It would pass down generations. There's gold that's locked away in Indian households. To that extent, the concept is a brilliant one to unlock the gold. But, uh, you know, the devil lies in the detail. The operational facts could be a bit of a problem. The pluses are that you're, you're unlocking a passive asset, something that lies dormant. I mean, you're going to get interest on that. And the fact that, you know, even if you want a loan against your gold, which is a fast, uh, you know, growing proposition in India, uh, a bond is a lot easier. Uh, on the flip side, when you look at it, the concerns are one, there is an emotional attachment to gold. Uh, you know, at, at the time of the IPO of uh, some of the, uh, you know, gold uh, lending companies, one of the points that uh, the chairman of one of those companies made is that we, we are almost insulated against risk on moral grounds as well as sentimental grounds for the simple reason that even if it's at a loss, quite a few people come forward to reclaim their gold and pay the amounts due for the simple reason that there's a sentimental attachment. It could have been gold passed on by the mother or grandmother or something like that. So Indians have a unique kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, behavioral pattern as far as gold is concerned. Then there is, you know, there's a plus of not having to store it or worry about where it's stored uh, in case you're using a bond. Uh, again, going back to the flip side, if you look at it, the interest rates on offer uh, without any income tax exemption uh, don't seem that exciting. I think Indians uh, by nature like income tax SOPs and I think the finance ministry has missed a trick on that front. Probably if they had introduced SOPs this scheme would have been a lot better received and last and most importantly you know there, there's always going to be a dispute regarding the you know carrot, uh, carotage of gold as you call it. So whereas you may presume your gold is 24 carat, uh, you know, the government evaluating authority of which uh, there is no clarity on the kind of infrastructure we have to evaluate. I think there is going to be some evaluation difference and dispute. So all in all, I think conceptually a good idea, but the proof of the pudding lies in its eating. Let, let's see how it rolls out. There are roadblocks, there are clear roadblocks which will have to be ironed out. I just wanted to uh, juxtapose the monetization scheme with the bond scheme and get your thoughts on you know the the relative advantages of the two let's talk a little bit more detail about the monetization scheme 
Yeah, clearly, you see, they're, they're doing it in three forms. There's a deposit, there's a bond, and there are coins. Coins, of course, is a no-brainer. Those who want to pick it, pick it. The idea is that you don't have to import coins. As far as the deposit goes, you, you buy yourself a gold deposit and you get a certain interest rate, which is taxable. It's really the, you know, the, the bond scheme where you exchange your gold and get a bond in return, and that, that, that's, that's fairly interesting. I, I think that's the one that is likely to grow the fastest of the three. Uh, once again, I think the ministry would need to take a relook at uh, the taxation aspect, offer some tax swap, even if it's a lower interest rate, and you would find a lot of takers. Okay. Uh, this is um, the perfect day that we're meeting, Ashok, uh, to talk about IPOs because uh, there's a contradiction out there. On the one hand, uh, the trend that we've been noticing is uh, subdued retail investor interest in recent IPOs and I know you've crunched the numbers on that but uh, when I said there's a contradiction it's because today Indigo made its debut and it's had a, a pretty uh, impressive debut on, uh, on a day when the street itself is in negative territory. Um, you know reflect on that a little bit. You're very clear. I mean, it, it uh, in many ways uh, endorses my viewpoint that retail investors, I mean, uh, I think the days of these public issues in the format that they are done in India are uh, long bygone. I think you need to move to the auction format. Clearly, it's the institutional investor that is driving the IPO market. Uh, retail participation is negligent. We are close to a 10-year low as far as retail participation goes. So I, I see very little uh, reason why a retail investor cannot participate through a mutual fund in an IPO. Uh, the direct participation also raises the possibility of, uh, you know, some kind of a scam which hurts small investors later. Uh, you know, coming to your point as to a good listing for Indigo, yes, Indigo is definitely the most efficient of the airline companies that we have. Having said that, you know, I'm, you know while I would use Indigo for my travel, I, I would hesitate still to, you know, buy into an aviation stock with a long-term perspective. Just to give you a perspective, even Jet Airways listed pretty well way back and uh, they too listed in a somewhat turbulent market. Okay, that's a point uh, worth absorbing and considering. Let's talk about mutual funds because you refer to the fact that if you want an exposure to some of these new entrants to the stock market, perhaps a safer route would be the mutual fund route. And here we are on the eve of Diwali when people make resolutions, uh, spring clean their homes and their portfolios. So, uh, you know, for all those various categories of viewers who are watching, let's pick out uh, a mutual fund strategy for them. I want to start with, you know, the first stage in a sense of uh, life cycle investing. That is an average age of between 20 to 40. Um, what's the investment message you'd like to reiterate? Yeah, clearly in the, in the kind of markets we are in, this is an ideal scenario for a young investor. You have volatility, which uh, presupposes that you should SIP, which is the systematic investment plan. You buy a sum every month and if you have a surplus sum, and it's, it's, you know, you have days when the markets goes, uh, you know, markets go into a vertical tailspin. You top up your investment. Th these are wonderful opportunities today because of online uh, facilities. You can make your investment at a very rapid rate. So uh, SIP plus uh, top up would be the ideal for the first category, which is the wealth creation category, age 20 to 40. Uh, you know, some of the uh, funds, two funds that I would, uh, uh, you know, recommend that uh, be looked out by investors would be the Franklin India Prima Plus, which uh, adopts a growth strategy. It has a sharp ratio, which is superior to those of its, uh, most of its peers and well above the benchmark. And it's been an absolute outperformer. They, they follow a growth strategy of investing. They follow a bottom-up strategy. They have a superior sharp ratio. All in all, it's been a fantastic performer. It's outperformed uh, the benchmark as well as most of its peers uh, right through, uh, you know, different time phases. The second fund that I would talk about in this category is the ICCI Pro Discovery Fund. Now, that uses a different method, which is the value method of investing. It started off as a mid-cap fund. As the fund size has grown, it's now a 10,000 crore plus fund. They made it a multi-cap fund. If you look at their holdings, it's multi-cap holdings. Again, an excellent fund, uh, you know, outperformer in its category. It has a very young fund manager who's, who's done exceptionally well. 
you look at the figures across various years, they are comfortably outperforming both the benchmark and the peers. So contrasting styles for both these funds, but ideal for investors. The younger investors could go, I mean, 20 to 30 perhaps with Pro Discovery, 30 to 40 with the Franklin India Primer Plus. Okay, let's talk about the next category of investors. And those are typically, well, I'm at the starting band of that category, uh, 40 to 55 years old. Uh, you know, what's the overarching advice you'd give to them and any uh, specific picks? Uh, Manvi, I thought you would be in the first category. At least you look it. Uh, you know, getting back to where we are, uh, you know, the second category, you go with balanced funds. You, you typically have a STP strategy, a systematic transfer plan, where you go in with a lump sum that uh, gradually gets uh, moved to the funds that you've chosen. So you're not really trying to time the market in any way. You're drawing the interest that you can get uh, during the period that the transition takes place. LNT Prudence Fund and Tata Balance Fund are two good funds in this category, the you know, top performers. The LNT Prudence Fund would be someone uh, you know, who's just starting in that category. It's slightly higher risk because the quality of debt paper is not uh, absolutely of the top variety, but uh, reasonably good variety. Their equity picks have been fairly good, well thought out picks. And again, uh, I think it's been an outperformer for the years that it has been there. So you, you typically have a balanced fund. You could also look at a defensive sectoral fund, which uh, you know, I, w I would suggest, you know, I'm, I'm a big uh, pharma fan. So Reliance Pharma comes to mind by default. Again, an exceptional performer across uh, various time frames. And interestingly, a pharma fund has invariably done well even in a down market. So again, uh, an outperformer in its category, it's, it's uh, you know, got a good sharp ratio. So all in all, I think uh, that that's the second fund that you could look at. Of course, there are a variety of funds. We, you know, due to paucity of time, we are looking at, uh, you know, a couple of picks from each uh, life cycle stage. Sure. And then, you know, we come to the third life cycle stage, which is, you know, the, a much more conservative investment approach that is uh, prescribed, which is, you know, 55 years old and above. I mean, first summarize uh, the overall investment approach they must take and then a couple of picks. Yeah, uh, by that stage, actually, you should be winding down equity and, uh, you know, making very defensive investment because a nightmare scenario would be to participate in uh, equity and lose a lot of money at that stage. So your equity exposure could be through uh, typically what are arbitrage funds, which offer you a superior tax, net of tax return uh, because they are, they are treated as equity funds. So you could look at some arbitrage funds, the MIP, which is predominantly a debt fund with a slight top up of equity. And you could, uh, you know, of course, most of your money would have to be parked in pure debt funds where the you know, element of risk is substantially lower. Uh, the strategy you would use a systematic withdrawal plan. Having built a corpus, you would pull out only what you need at that stage so that the corpus continues to grow because it's predominantly going to be debt and interest uh, driven uh, kind of a strategy. Uh, two specific funds that, again, uh, that could be looked at, uh, the ID, IDFC Dynamic Equity Fund, which is a you know, balanced fund using arbitrage. It's a PE-driven fund. The asset allocation changes based on PE. That's a fairly scientific way to do it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unlikely to be a great outperformer. At the same time, you know, when, when you have, uh, it's categorized as equity, so whatever you get will be with you as long as you held it for one year. So all in all, a defensive kind of a balance fund which you can look at. The second one uh, in the pure debt category where you are using a MIP, it would be the, uh, the Birla MIP2 Savings Phi Scheme, which, which has been an exceptional performer again. Uh, high quality debt paper, marginal equity, and they have managed to do the trick. They have beaten the benchmark regularly. Uh, they, they look a healthy fund. All in all, I, I think these are all funds that uh, one could look at for the somewhat year ahead. Okay, I'm just going to reiterate. For the 25 to 40, you've picked Franklin India Primer Plus and ICICI Pro Value Discovery. You had also flagged off for the 40 to 55 category, the LNT Prudence and Reliance Pharma. And for the 55 year old and above, first of all, the most important takeaway is that, you know, this is the time to pare down your equity exposure, which at best should be 20 to 25 percent. Uh, picks include IDFC Dynamic Equity and uh, Birla MIP2 Savings 5. Um, Ashok, it's always a pleasure to have you here on NDTV Profit. And from the entire team and me here is wishing you a happy and prosperous Diwali. I uh, wish you the same, Manvi, for your team and for the viewers. And I end with a disclaimer that we and our clients hold each of these funds that we've spoken about. So it's only fair that the viewers know that.
and we have Thank been uh, we have been positioning that to our viewers during the course of the conversation in terms of disclosure. Thanks very much, Ashok. Uh, good uh, speaking to you today.